Hello, and a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today for this uh, webinar on heritage conservation learning in the COVID world, challenges and opportunities. It's organized as part of the ICROM lecture series in partnership with Athabasca University and the International Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, IIC. For those of you who do not yet know ICROM, we are an intergovernmental organization in the service, working the service of 137 member states across the world to promote the conservation of all forms of cultural heritage for the benefit of all people. Before we start, I'd like to inform that we have set aside the last part of this webinar for a Q&A session. Please send us your questions and comments via the Q&A icon that you see at the bottom of the Zoom window. We are looking forward to your participation in the webinar. In case we don't have time to put all of your questions to the speakers, please send us an email and we will get back to you. Today, we will focus on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on heritage conservation learning. The COVID-19 crisis has led to the lockdown of education and training institutions globally and the disruption of learning. Educators had to shift to remote learning by using online platforms, applications and resources in order to continue with teaching and to communicate and connect with students and learners. Heritage conservation was no exception to that. This webinar discussed the way that heritage conservation practice learning has occurred during the pandemic by highlighting the challenges facing this practical field and the learning opportunities for today and the future. Let me now welcome my dear co-facilitators today, Professor Shabnam Inalu Dailu from Athabasca University. Hello, Shabnam. Hello, everyone. Professor, Professor Jane Henderson, Secretary General of IIC. Hello, Jane, welcome. Hello, everyone. We are joined by seven speakers today representing heritage conservation teachers and students from around the world. And it's my great pleasure to introduce them to you now. We start with uh, Fiona Graham, tutor in conservation heritage resource management program at Athabasca University in Canada, and adjunct professor art conservation programs at Queen's University also in Canada. Welcome Fiona. Hello. Next, we have uh, David Cohen, Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Arts and Humanity, Universidad de Los Andes in Colombia. Bienvenido, David. Gracias. Thank you, everyone. Then we have uh, Terry Little, a former colleague from ICROM and currently a senior lecturer at Ahmadou Bello University in Nigeria. Terry is also senior advisor of the Trust for African Rock Art in Kenya. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. Next, we have Eleonora Sermoneta. Eleonora is a student of Heritage Resource Management Program at Athabasca University. And she's also adult programmer at the Royal Alberta Museum in Canada. Welcome, Eleonora. Next, we have Amber Bati. Amber is a student at the MSc Conservation Practice at Cardiff University in the UK. Welcome, Amber. Hello, thank you. Next, we have uh, Sagita Miriam Sunara, Assistant Professor, Conservation Restoration Department. Sagita is also Vice Dean of Art Science and International Collaboration at the University of Split in Croatia. Welcome, Sagita. Hi, and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> And last but not least, we have uh, Satish Pandey. Satish is associate professor and head at the Department of Art Conservation at the National Museum Institute in India. He's also an IIC council member. Welcome. Satish. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here with us. Thank you. The webinar will have three parts. So first, to set the scene and provide some data to inform our discussions. I'll, I'll briefly present the main findings of a survey that uh, ICROM ran on the topic of today's uh, webinar. Then we'll move on to the discussion with our panelists, which will be structured around a series of guiding questions facilitated by Professor Jane Henderson. 
And then after that, we'll have our Q&A session led by Professor Shabnam Inandu uh, from Athabasca University. Once again, please use only the Q&A uh, box to, to post your questions and comments. Thank you. I'll now kindly ask our uh, co-facilitators and panelists to turn their cameras off so that I can share the results of the survey and then we'll get you back on. Thank you. The survey was online, launched in April 2020 and targeting uh, heritage conservation teachers. It was available in, in English and Spanish. And I'll share with you the main findings. It was also an anonymous survey. So we have received uh, 117 complete response from this number of teachers engaged in different areas of heritage conservation teaching, as you can see here in this, uh, in this graph, covering different typologies, different areas related to conservation teaching. So it was a, a good representation of the profession. First, we asked them, how was teaching before COVID hit? And as you can see summarized here, face-to-face -face lectures was the most common modality used by teachers with a strong component of hands-on, on-site and group exercise. Only a small fraction, as you can see in the lower part of the graph, was already teaching online. So this was the situation pre-COVID. Then we had the pandemic. And at that point, so we asked the, the respondents if they were prepared to shift to remote teaching. And here you can see a summary of the, the response. So only the only 10% who were already teaching online said that they were totally prepared. So one in every 10 teachers. On the other, on the opposite side of that spectrum, we had about a quarter or one in four teachers were not prepared at all. A third of them were a little prepared, one in three, and also one in every three teachers were moderately prepared. So looked all together, I think we could uh, extract from that that the profession was not very well prepared to shift uh, to remote teaching uh, at such a sudden pace. The next question was about the main challenges faced by the teachers when they had to move shifting online. The number of responses you see here exceeds the number of uh, professions who took the survey, because in these questions, just for clarification, we ask each respondent to list up to three main challenges. So we would have a potential total of 351 uh, answers. And then we got the, the number of responses that you can see here. So up to three for each respondent. The main challenge, according to the survey, was the impossibility of uh, having hands-on or and or on-site experiment experience to to uh, teach and learn conservation practice. So that was the main concern. Next, we had the difficulty of adapting teaching materials and techniques normally used in the in-person modality to be uh, adapted for online teaching. That was also a challenge that voice, voiced by a number of the professionals. Interpersonal interactions, professor with students, but also students with students and sometimes teachers with teachers were compromised. So in terms of engagement, attention, so that was a challenge that the, the teachers faced. The next one had to do with the information communication technology uh, issues, including poor or unstable internet connection, digital literacy or lack of by the teachers, sometimes by students, uh, limitations of software to deliver you know, the contents and, and, and learning environment online. So there was a series of ICT issues that uh, uh, hindered somehow not the post challenge to, to teachers when they moved online. And last but not least, the time pressure to have to switch very fast into online mode and continue to teach 
but also issues of time management in terms of the duration of, of lecture sessions, for instance, and the attention span of students, and also issues uh, concerning the, the balance between work and private life as teachers had to work from home. So here we have the main challenge uh, faced by this, this group of teachers. Next question had to do with useful resources that teachers found online to continue to teach once they had to move into online. So as you can see here, we have uh, significantly less responses compared to the previous one, which can be interpreted as there were not so many resources available or not all teachers found useful resources. Here I have divided into blue, shades of blue, those resources that are generic. So they were not uh, specific to conservation. For instance, the whole range of online platforms from Zoom to WebEx to Microsoft Teams, et cetera. This was uh, about a third of the useful resource reported. And thinking about that, it's, it's relevant. Imagine if the pandemic had hit a couple of decades ago where we did not have any of those platforms. What would it be like to go online? It would be much more difficult, right? Then they also mention online communities to connect, to engage, to exchange, and uh, online resources on how to teach online in general. So they, they benefited from. In green here, you can see uh, conservation uh, specific uh, resources. And here I divided them by typology, where you can see conservation videos were the, the most uh, mentioned. Then moving on to online publications about conservation, websites of major national and international organizations dealing with conservation, webinars, 5%. And then there are some of the professionals mentioned data, database online, like historic map database, image database, et cetera, and some virtual tours that started to occur, all conservation related. And then there was a fracture that only mentioned online materials about conservation in general. So there was not possible to specify. The next questions, and here we are looking at a, a group of questions where the respondents or the participants were asked to propose solutions to cope with uh, having to go and teach online. And here the size of each circle is proportional to the number of uh, response we receive. So first and foremost, we have the, the proposal to diversify and adapt teaching modalities. And that means not only integrate new online resources, but to create new ways to deliver also practical exercise uh, through creative approaches. For instance, um, asking students to use objects they had at home as a proxy to do hands-on exercise, sending material kits, deliver them at home by mail to students so that they could use them and practice at home. So there was a, a wide range of suggestions in terms of diversifying and adapting teaching modality was the strong, strongest answer here. Next, we had the proposal, and here was more like a, a realization that is absolutely necessary to ensure accessibility and technical support. Accessibility in terms of you know, IT infrastructure, internet connection, hardware, software, but also in terms of digital literacy so that everybody can make the most of the technology and technical support from the respective organizations was uh, deemed here as essential as well. Next, we have uh, three equivalent answers. Here in yellow, we can see diligent and focused preparation. So here, teachers were saying, we have to focus on what matters. The time is limited, the attention span is limited. It takes a lot of effort and time to prepare. So we have to be very much focused on what exactly we wanna teach, transparent, transparency with the goals, and be diligent, be well prepared to deliver successfully. That was one uh, proposal. Next to it, we had a proposal to be more interactive and engaging more with students. 
in terms of uh, co-curating content, for instance, was a suggestion, integrating social media, more collaborative exercise to bring students you know, on board also both ways, kind of more participatory process as part of teaching. Then there is the adjusting of activities timing in terms of uh, having shorter modules or shorter sessions, more breaks in between, more flexibility, and also to adjust in terms of uh, balancing better, again, uh, as you are working from home, personal and, and work life. So that was a strong point here that uh, called the attention of the respondents. Then there was also a proposal to innovate and besides adapting and diversifying to creating new teaching aids, new tools and resources, including, for instance, uh, virtual reality, you know, uh, uh, participatory uh, processes online that people can interact with real, real size models, etc., or a, a repository, a go to place online with the teaching resources and things like that. So things that do not exist yet that were already envisaged. And last but not least, a stronger, uh, closer exchange with peers in terms of experience, materials, etc. So very rich here. Next question was on what they perceive as uh, positive aspects of moving to teach online. And here's a summary of the main aspects that were uh, mentioned. First of all, it fostered innovation, adaptation, and resilience in, in the professionals, right? Also in terms of what I've said, adapt, innovate, and be creative, don't be afraid, so be strong. Be, and then I think because of that, we'll be better prepared to a next pandemic or a next crisis if, if we continue to, to have to teach online. Uh, the next positive aspect was the in increased accessibility and availability of contents. Here, they related to the fact that lectures can be recorded, they can be available online for subsequent use and reuse. There's the possibility to uh, use artificial intelligence and do uh, simultaneous translation, automatic translation, so it can reach uh, widely, globally. Not so the resource that you can get. Uh, um, uh, visiting professors or lectures from around the world online very easily, right? So there was increased accessibility as perceived by the, the respondents. The next aspect was uh, less commuting, less pollution, less cost, less time constraints. Some people felt uh, uh, less stress. So there was a less there in terms of carbon footprinting and, and flexibility. So that was perceived as a positive aspect. After that, we had uh, some, some of the teachers mentioning that there was an improvement in their interaction with students in terms of uh, sometimes uh, uh, more attention, more participation. Some respondents said they could better read the body language and interpret from, from the, you know, the face of the students who, are, who were participating uh, uh, what exactly it was meant. So they felt no, there was more uh, engagement, we, although it's a fraction, because as you can remember, one of the challenges was uh, engaging the students. So I think that was a divide there. Uh, it allows for a global reach, of course, through the internet to reach a wider audience. Uh, in, interesting here, uh, going online forces students autonomy in terms of uh, being able or doing more uh, self-research you know, peer review, so taking more uh, the lead, let's say, in, in the, the learning experience. So that was perceived as a positive. And of course, less exposure to COVID risk as uh, everybody stayed at home. But, and here I'll quote you know, some, uh, some of the replies, none of that positive aspects apply to practical teaching. Conservation would have a face-to-face -face component for sure. It's efficient, but not quite effective yet. And it, some said this is okay for the theoretical part. And I think that's something that we're going to discuss here today. You know, how can we impart or how can practical skills that are at the core of conservation be taught online or can they? Last but not least, before I conclude, this is the the lessons learned according to the respondents. 
So most of them almost half said they discovered new ways of teaching. So it was a discovery moment with all the online resources and being creative and have not being pushed to be innovative. So that was a discovery moment. And then that was a lesson learned that there's a no alternative way that can be explored to, to teach conservation. Then uh, important to keep a positive mindset and attitude. So that was a lesson learned you know, in, in these times of crisis and difficulties. Uh, it was also mentioned as a lesson learned that the well-being and interpersonal interactions you know, among students and, and teachers is fundamental for, for the learning process. We live in an uncertain world, so we have to be better prepared. Then uh, there's also as a lesson learned, I think there was a discovery that, that we are a, a connected global community. One answer said that the internet shrinks the world. So I think it was a discovery that we are you now conservation teachers and learners across the, the world and we are connected. So I think that was a lesson learned by, by some of the respondents. And last but not least, institutional support uh, is uh, very important if we want to continue or not to, to, to teach online successfully. So with this, I, uh, I conclude the presentation of the main findings of the survey. I hope you know, this will give some uh, thought provoking ideas for the discussions that will follow. And now I'll give the floor to Professor Jane Henderson who leads the, the discussion and now I also invite all the panelists to join us for the second phase of the webinar. Thank you. Jane, over to you. You are muted, Jane, sorry. I can start by being the first person to forget to unmute, so that takes the pressure off everyone else. Thank you so much for that introduction. I think we were all making frantic notes there and thinking how much it was useful to hear back the reflection of maybe some of the thoughts that we tried to put out to Ecom when we completed the survey. I'll be asking all the panelists to comment on some of what we decided were some of the core questions. Um, and that's the session which will be sort of curated, I, say, I suppose. And then the questions that you're putting in the Q&A will come up in the next session with Shabna. So the first question I'm putting to Fiona Graham, who I believe is gonna shake things up with a million dollar question, which is, do you think it is possible to teach conservation during a global pandemic in a way that the graduates are prepared to enter the workplace? Hi everybody. Um, and hello from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and uh, Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, I'll answer that question with what should probably be my tagline, which is it depends. Um, it depends on the nature of the program and the interests of the students. If the program includes training in conservation treatment uh, or the operation of specialized imaging and analytical equipment, for example, those aspects will probably suffer. Um, I can't say whether it's possible to adequately learn bench skills required for conservation in a remote manner. I know that there are many teachers and students um, who are working to find ways to do so, and I'll leave it up to them to answer that particular question. What I can say unequivocally and based on 16 years of online teaching experience is that it is possible to learn most heritage conservation skills without being face-to-face -face in person. So while many students enter heritage conservation with the idea that their sole activity will be the hands-on restoration of artifacts or works of art, and I apologize, I'm sticking with the mo movable cultural heritage in this response, um, conservation involves much more than treatment and even treatment requires a great deal of background knowledge that can be taught remotely. Students need to learn the material characteristics and fabrication methods of heritage resources how imaging and analytical techniques can provide information to benefit conservation and how those techniques work. The manner in which materials deteriorate and how to prevent it. In other words, preventive conservation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, conservation products and processes used in preventive conservation and treatment. The ethics of conservation and how decisions are made with regard to interventions. 
the role of other heritage professionals in the conservation of heritage resources, the sustainability implications of conservation decisions, the role of conservation in sustaining or dismantling colonial systems, and finally, risk assessment and conservation planning. So the amount that this represents relative to the whole curriculum will depend on the training program, but it is certainly a significant chunk of the teaching. And learning it to a high level can certainly be done remotely if the instructors use principles and practices developed by experts in remote teaching. Of course, there are drawbacks to remote learning. Uh, we just saw some of those listed in the survey. Um, personally, I find it more difficult to develop a bond with students. Um, the students I teach in person do reach out more often with questions and concerns. Also, um, a reminder that there are actually two modes of remote teaching, one where students move through a course as a cohort and one where students um, follow their own schedules. Uh, when there's an actual class of students, you can have real-time conversations amongst the group and develop a community, a network. Um, but when there's no class, but only individual students, there's the benefit of flexibility, but the drawback of not being able to learn from one's fellow students and to develop a network. There are also, as was mentioned in the survey, some unique benefits to remote learning. Um, the main one for me is that it eliminates some barriers. Students don't have to move to another city or another country to learn. They can stay at home and avoid paying rent in a second location. They can stay with their families. Reducing the financial barrier and some of the social and logistical barriers means that conservation training is open to a broader range of students. As long as the remote learning system is not designed to add new barriers, such as unreasonable bandwidth or uh, other IT requirements. And again, there are people out there who have been delivering remote training, including conservation training for many years, um, and who can help maximize the benefits and minimize the constraints. So to conclude, I believe that the bulk of foundational conservation training can be undertaken during a global pandemic in a way that prepares students to enter the workplace. But I don't know yet whether we have proof that certain aspects, such as bench skills, can be successfully taught under these conditions. Fantastic, Fiona. That was a really thoughtful answer. Um, and what I'd really like to hear is other people's perspectives. Are we over-centering bench skills in this discussion? Are we over-optimistic? Or is this just a real opportunity to reduce barriers to conservation education? What do you think? Are we going to get any comments from any of you? Um, I would just like to say that um, from what we have heard from the student perspective is that although they've acknowledged that you can learn the theory online, they are really quite concerned about the hands-on and practical side of this. So I, I don't know how we'll be able to get through this and make it work but some students have already managed to, um, as I will discuss a bit later, but that's all I wanted to say on my end. Thank you, Amber. So do we feel that um, perhaps those of us who are perhaps a little bit more senior in the profession are a bit more comfortable about the skills apart from the bench skills? Would anyone else like to comment? Go on, Terry, thank you. Yeah, I would. I think it's important, perhaps, to make a difference between the bench skills and um, and let's say education about preventive conservation. Uh, I think the in my mind the bench skills really do benefit from in person experiences and so on. And perhaps a difference is also in that I'm I'm working very much with immovable heritage uh, in landscapes and so on. So perhaps there's some difference. Um, made in whether it's movable or immovable heritage that we're talking about. Certainly, Terry, you'd have very little choice but to go to your collections to work with them. And can I tease any more answers out of you? I think Sagit is almost on the verge of volunteering. <laughs> Well, yes, I, I, I would actually like to share with you, if I may, a quote. Um, 
uh, as I was preparing for this webinar, I reached out to my colleagues from the conservation restoration study programs in, in Split, where I teach, in Zagreb and in Dubrovnik, and I asked them to share some thoughts that they had on this issue. And I would like to share with you just a brief quote from a colleague uh, who teaches um, in Zagreb, Zvezana Jembrich, and uh, she teaches courses which are very um, practice orientated. And uh, she was stressing the importance, uh, for example, of uh, on-site work, so in situ treatments uh, or any kind of activities. And she said uh, that nothing can replace such an experience uh, for a student because uh, in a virtual setting, we can uh, visually transfer something, some information, but we, cannot, uh, but we cannot touch or smell or sense or orientate or meet people and, and uh, embark on conversations or even, for example, save uh, a piece of polychromy that has fallen off an object. And I think those experiences are very important for students. And with that, I will conclude. <laughs> Um, can I just say something that uh, a, a, a non-conservation colleague mentioned to me when I uh, talked to him about what I was about to present? And he said, well, um, you can certainly learn how to conserve uh, digital uh, assets remotely, digital artworks. So um, again, just another thing that there, there are there are many types of conservation. Um, not all of them, uh, not all of them deal with um, uh, with with um, require require bench skills um certainly i'm not saying that i'm not saying that um the face-to-face -face does not have uh huge advantages but um to try and just say that um you know with with experience um and uh i have and other people have developed practical um uh exercises where um using what is around them in their homes or in other people's um, in terms of, you know, learning to recognize materials and, and types of deterioration and coming up with, um, <clears throat> with approaches uh, and, and identification techniques and that kind of thing. There, there, is, there is more than can be done than may be apparent. Um, uh, and we given the circumstances we're we're working under just trying to trying to find the the silver linings <laughs> i think it was was my emphasis so of course with our silver linings we'll get the texture we'll get the shininess it might have a nice sort of a noise that it makes clearly whether we're teaching online or in person some of the things that sagita mentioned the sense and the experience are things that you cannot understand conservation without but perhaps we'll have to dig a little deeper in an online world to, to stimulate them. People can come back in at any point on any of the questions, but I'll move on to David with the next question for now. Um, but if anyone does have any more thoughts on that, um, then you're welcome to come back in. But David, you're getting the chance to look um, at the positives. What have you learned so far from your experiences during the COVID lockdowns? Thank you, Jane, for your questions. And um, going to that, I have learned that virtuality does not necessarily mean theoretical. I think this is certainly nothing new uh, as many academic programs in conservations have a broad online experience, as indeed is the case of at the Basque University, as Fiona was telling us. However, um, when the lockdown began in Colombia, um, me and other colleagues had to improvise practical sessions on many topics in order to complete the ongoing seminars at the time that have been designed face-to-face uh, -face seminars. And somehow this pandemic uh, took us all by surprise. Uh, from the use of equipment for environmental monitoring to viewing samples on a microscope, it was necessary to search for digital resources on the internet in record time. Collaborative work between teachers and also between students and teachers was straightened despite social distancing. And we found resources that we will not have explored otherwise. I mean, we have to look after them. I'm talking, for example, about virtual tours of museums, online microscopes, videos, interactive maps, among others. Other academic processes have also become more efficient. Um, just four months ago, five months ago, uh, suggesting a thesis dissertation through a virtual session was almost impossible. And in fact, many of us didn't know even uh, what Zoom, Blackboard, WebEx, or Microsoft Teams was. 
uh, they will call you uh, the lazy fellow if you propose something like that, if you know what I mean. But uh, today, the idea of seeing a terrifying students inside a classroom is practically exotic. Uh, my point is that virtuality uh, brought with it some temporary elements, as well as some others that have surely come to stay. One of those elements also has to do with the autonomy of the students. And this is a very important part. There are multiple tools that they can use to explore their own creativity, such as Battle of People or Factory, um, Tingling, to mention only a few, and to better exploit the content they produce. Also, platforms such as generally emails or expeditions, among many others, uh, that allow us as teachers to improve our presentations and how we communicate our ideas. Of course, uh, the use of these tools and in general terms, the quick response we had uh, here in Colombia uh, was possible thanks to the investment that the university has made in training and resources for both teachers and students, uh, which formally allow us to finish the academic semester. In August of this year, we start a new term and a complete different story since most of the university courses are still virtual, but uh, we had almost two months to prepare them. In my case, I work mainly on the design of demonstrations uh, with the creation of samples and with the use of equipment that the university sent to my home. Uh, right now, my bedroom uh, looks like a laboratory and I have to say my wife is not very happy with that idea, but it's the only space that I can darken to do UV light fluorescence and uh, light practices. I have also designed uh, home-based exercises for the students to understand the effects of the agents of deterioration on different materials, such as, I don't know, uh, soaking pieces of wood or paper and drying them later in the oven, uh, decolorating prints or photographs, taking advantage of the 10,000 luxes uh, that we frequently have here in Bogota, and so on. Uh, I don't know if they have worked that well or not, and this is still an ongoing seminar, so I have not made a final evaluation, but at least I can say that the students are having a lot more fun than my boring traditional sessions. Uh, I can see this in their faces, of course, and in some comments I have received, but also in the level of attendance that have not declined through the semester, as it usually happens. Finally, I would like to talk about what is coming next. Um, facing these kind of challenges necessarily involves thinking outside of the box, uh, at least for us. I mean, we, we're not uh, get used to virtual environment before. It implies being more flexible and being more attentive about the way we have doing the evaluations of the seminars and training. I think it also implies that museums and cultural institutions need more flexibility as well and open their collections and buildings to new academic uses. So far, and of course, taking security considerations into account, the virtual tours of museums that are available online have focused precisely on their visible areas. Uh, and to be honest, are not the most interesting ones to carry out certain conservations or rig assessment practices. Since the return to physical presence is not your close, um, and I certainly believe that a pharmacological solution is still far away despite the news and especially in countries like Colombia. So I, it will keep going on this way for a while. So we have to adapt and also uh, cultural institutions. Uh, we have separated, we are separated, uh, but we are not alone. And it's hard not to see the students. And this is the dark side of, of the experience. Uh, sometimes they don't even turn on their cameras. And I, I have a, a personal view, this constant feeling of talking to screen. Uh, but it has been proved through human history that crisis brings out the surface our best. So I would like to encourage professors, students, and museums to keep going, to take an advantage 
of this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. You brought the light to us, whether it's the Colombian daylight fading or the ultraviolet light you're exposing your wife to in the bedroom laboratory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting times for all of us and our other halves. Um, does anybody else want to share what they've learned in, in their experience in COVID? Eleonora. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to share what I could learn from uh, observation. Uh, I think that institutions working in uh, the heritage conservation field have been incredibly responsive to the changed need of the conservation community at a global level. They open up to new collaborations and we've seen a variety of international connections and partnership, uh, partnerships flourishing during this period. Uh, I guess in addition to that, new knowledge sharing practices have been developed and, for example, this webinar is uh, pretty much a proof of that. Uh, these practices made access to a number of resources possible for students around the world and conservation institutions are now rethinking teaching and learning models in uh, heritage conservation and working to find these uh, creative alternative and students are having uh, some fun, as David uh, just said. So in a way, I think that from what I could see, uh, you know, many institutions are turning a global crisis into an opportunity for sure. So definitely uh, I could see some, uh, some positive experiences, many positive experiences actually. Thank you. So there has been quite a lot of positivity there in terms of learning. I guess it's because we're a learning community that we enjoy the adaption and the challenge. Has anyone else anything that they would like to share on that? It does lead rather well into the question I'm going to put to Terry next otherwise, which um, is that what, what do you think, Terry, are the consequences for our profession, for the conservation profession of the increased online sharing and the availability of knowledge that um, David was talking about and Eleonora? Thank you. I think what I'd, I'd like to begin with an overview of the COVID situation in the two countries where I mostly work and live to give a context to my intervention, which I think is a bit different perhaps from the other panelists. So in Kenya, with a population of 51 million, there have been approximately 38,000 cases, about 650 deaths. And in Nigeria, with a population of around 200 million, there have been 58,000 cases and 1,100 deaths. So relatively moderate rates, I think, um, in respect to other countries. Both countries put into place very strict measures starting in March, including lockdowns, closure of international and internal borders and curfews. Federal and national educational institutions from preschool to universities also shut down from March in both countries, with openings possibly in January. And I've just heard today, possibly in October in Kenya. And there are also strikes at the federal universities in Nigeria. And although some private colleges are offering online learning options, uh, but to my knowledge, none of the institutions, these institutions um, offering online courses have studies which could be considered linked to heritage conservation. The reasons behind the inability to switch to online will be familiar to you and I think was, has already been highlighted by others, mainly due to the lack of access to affordable internet, the lack of hardware and software, but also insufficient institutional planning to be able to face such an unprecedented situation. And I can believe this can be said for institutions on every continent. As we saw earlier, the survey results show only 10% uh, of us uh, in the teaching profession prepared to shift to online teaching. So the digital divide is, is not a fiction. Then to get to your question, I think I can be succinct. What are the consequences for the conservation profession of, of increased online sharing and availability of knowledge, in two words, mostly negative. Um, 
And that because knowledge is being shared and made available online does not mitigate the fact that at least in terms of the university context, the fact that content may be increasingly made available online does not mean that students have access to it. And again, I'm talking mainly from my, my contacts and my experience in a way. And that brings us back to the question of access to internet and computers. Uh, along with that, the possibilities or lack of possibilities of doing field work or internships to gain practical experience, I think this year will be a real setback for the next class of conservators and heritage professionals. Uh, and again, perhaps this is in a bit in contrast to what Fiona uh, was saying earlier, and again, perhaps linked to different areas that we're working with, uh, me being mainly immovable and working in landscapes and her uh, talking about movable heritage. I think the, the cancellation of conferences and workshops has also been a setback since these are especially important uh, networking spaces for young professionals. If I look outside the university context on the positive side, which I'm happy to note, I think more than an increased um, of online availability of knowledge, I sense that there has been an increase in shared experiences and an increase in sharing of professional and personal experiences between colleagues through online platforms and communities. Uh, but these communities have also served to encourage and motivate one another in times when we're so isolated. Uh, and I might just mention in Africa, most of my networks use WhatsApp um, as a platform to share updates. And I do think there have been many examples of extraordinary efforts by colleagues to think outside the box. And I think this is the point that David was making. And I think this will benefit the field and the profession in the long run. And I would like to take this moment to, to recognize and congratulate institutions like ECROM, UNESCO, African World Heritage Fund, and ICOM for their efforts not only to make content available, but to, to diversify and adapt in order to organize activities like these webinars, which bring people and ideas together. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And thank you also for reminding us of that context because, you know, yes, we do enjoy using Padlet and, and, and the things that David mentioned and trying out scrunching up bits of wood and putting them in the oven. But, um, but yes, we are all living around us and it's almost, it's like a, a shadow around us that sometimes we don't look at and we have to be reminded of uh, of, of the way that impacts not only in our time, but also on our energy and our emotion and that of all of our partners, the students and, and co-workers. So um, yeah, we can't, we can't really forget about that. And, and I know that in a context like this, we all feel the, that we should be putting our best face forward and talking about our optimistic aspects, but I think it's very useful for all of us to share as well our concerns so that none of us feel isolated in our darker assessment of things and, and the harder parts of, of, of trying to keep going through this. So thank you. Would anybody else like to share what they think, particularly for the profession, the consequence might be? Terry did give quite a big range there. David. Yeah, thank you. I would like to add that uh, Terry showed us a very important point here. It's about technology access um, and, and how it's not well distributed around the world. Even here in Colombia, we have some areas where students have good internet connections and technology, but we certainly have dark places as well. Um, very near to the reality of Africa or other uh, areas in the world. So this is true. This is true. I, I, I'm sure this perspective as well. Sagita also let comment. Yeah, um, well, um, I just wanted to say, well, in countries, fortunately, Croatia is one of them that do not have such a problem with access uh, to internet and thus to online uh, content. I would say that uh, our programs uh, can uh, and do benefit gr greatly from this uh, sharing of uh, knowledge and ideas, either through webinars, but also uh, online conferences and many other formats 
and uh, speaking from my perspective, my program, for example, we, we do have limited budget. We do not have opportunity to have invited speakers from all over the world. So uh, having this opportunity to have these people virtually uh, through webinars is, I think, a great uh, asset and, and something that uh, our program and our students primarily benefit greatly from. But um, I would like to uh, also use this opportunity to uh, notify those in the audience who perhaps do not know, as this has been mentioned, um, increased numbers of online platforms. And I would like to point the attention uh, of the audience uh, to something called Access or Academic Conservation Education Sharing Site, which is an online platform that was um, launched in uh, April. Uh, and the incentive came from this situation that the uh, conservation restoration study programs found themselves in. And the initial idea was to share experiences in online teaching uh, and also to discuss some of the challenges related to uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, and so if, if you want to join uh, this platform, it is open to academic educators, uh, both from a conservation restoration field and conservation science field. Um, you should email uh, the platform uh, administrators. There are six of them and you can find their names and emails email addresses in the June, July issue of News in Conservation, which is available through IIC website. So I think it's an amazing opportunity. People who were experiencing same problems, they came together, shared some ideas, teaching resources. There is also a wonderful opportunity on the platform. You can either offer or request an online class, which is, I think, an amazing thing. But the idea is uh, to have this platform alive and running after the pandemic uh, uh, so that in the future uh, we can also share ideas and experiences related to classical or uh, classroom teaching so to speak thank you sagita and as you were doing a little plug i was going to just mention there um because terry mentioned about conferences that the iac conference which was going to be in edinburgh is going to be entirely virtual it will be interesting to see to what extent people can build networks in a new format. But it is also important to acknowledge that the Getty have supported attendance, which includes provision of equipment for, for some people. And I think that sort of digital exclusion thing is something we have to manage incredibly carefully. People may you know, talk about the situation in Africa, but we did a survey of our own students here in Wales and a third of them were struggling to get the access to the internet, whether it's because they were having to share with you know, family members or housemates or brothers and sisters. So it can be a huge thing. Um, would anybody else like to comment about the um, increased online availability and sharing of knowledge? And the one other thing I have heard, and I don't know if other people have heard, okay, so we'll come back to Terry, is that it's almost overwhelming. There's almost too much that, that you've, you've got the huge format, the fear of missing out going on. But um, back to you, Terry. No, okay, actually, I, I just wanted to mention, I'd be interested to know what the students on our panel uh, think about this question. Maybe they're going to address it in their own talks because actually, you know, since March, I have not been, uh, had access to students because the universities have been completely shut down. So I, I'm speaking from the point of view of, of a content provider, of an educator. Go for Amber. <laughs> Um, so from a student's perspective, we've heard a lot of comments of our students saying that these online resources and the availability of knowledge has actually been quite vital in keeping them connected to their learning and feeling like they're still part of the conservation community, you know, whether that's watching webinars or new accessible articles or you know, even forming informal mentorships in some cases and a lot of them have said that it's been really very helpful for them i think that um Terry, you made it impossible for me not to move on to my next question which is to the the student representatives who i know have been collecting um masses and masses of feedback um and i think that's really positive to be able to come and talk to the educators in a very confident position that you're in. So really what we were wondering was what are the priorities for heritage conservation students in a COVID and in a post COVID world? And we'd love to hear your thoughts and the thoughts of all the um, feedback you've been collecting. All right, thank you, Jane. Uh, and uh, hello from uh, 36 territory. I will be starting and uh, Amber will follow up. 
So our question deals with the priorities uh, for heritage conservation students in a COVID and post-COVID world. And in order to reach out to heritage conservation students and learn about their experiences as well as their priorities during COVID, my colleague Amber from Cardiff University and I set up uh, social media pages on uh, major platforms uh, such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We amplified the student voices and essentially created a virtual place for them to safely share their experiences, questions, and concerns. And they had a lot of them, for sure. Uh, in a less than a month, we got over 900 followers. Uh, our posts reached more than 14,000 users on Facebook, 21,000 on Twitter, and almost 2,000 on Instagram. Uh, same contents work quite differently on uh, different platforms, of course. Uh, Additionally, the Facebook event we created to promote these uh, uh, webinar reached over 68,000 users from uh, 45 countries, from Netherlands to Tanzania. We really wanted to have a diverse and global perspectives. Uh, uh, we asked students a number of questions about how COVID affected their learning experiences, and their responses helped us paint quite an interesting picture. We also had a little bit of a survey. So for example, we ran a series of uh, Twitter polls and learned that 78.6% uh, of the students who responded to the first poll experienced some levels of disruption of their learning during COVID. However, 73.3% of the respondents were also able in some way to continue with their studies or training. We also learned that 58.3% of the respondents felt supported by their instructors and teachers during this period, which is quite encouraging considering the uncertainties of the time. Uh, while from the analysis of the comment we received across the three social media platform, finding alternative placement opportunities emerged as a strong priority among conservation students. As Amber will illustrate, ensuring access to practical work creating alternative hands-on learning opportunities and getting enough lab time were recurring topics among, among our uh, online community. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Um, as Eleonora has mentioned, finding alternative placement opportunities was a strong priority amongst conservation students. Um, and many of them expressed they would like some sort of support in finding alternatives to these traditional placements. And while it was recognized that theoretical knowledge could be conveyed online, the most common priority that we observed was that students wanted to make sure that they would have enough hands-on learning and lab time. In fact, when we asked, most students said that they felt that online learning couldn't replace the practical element of heritage conservation. And I think this insecurity then about this lack of hands-on experience was often followed by concerns that these students would be um, undesirable to employers, especially compared to pre-COVID students who may have had more practical work in their portfolios, for example. Um, students have suggested that maybe, you know, employers may have to reconsider their expectations, considering these changes to the students' abilities to receive as much practical experience as before COVID. But for some positives, um, regarding hands-on work, a student studying in Amsterdam that we spoke to said that they'd managed to continue hands-on learning through uh, staggered teaching times, and they've managed to do so in a socially distanced and safe environment. So she's quite pleased with how they're managing to go ahead with things. Additionally, from some interactions with conservation students at Cardiff University, students expressed that they were willing to adapt and cooperate with the university you know, to ensure that they can gain the necessary practical experience to not only eventually get a job within the sector, but just to feel confident within their own abilities. And just to round it up, um, the geographic diversity of our student audience really did highlight the impact of COVID on the heritage conservation communities on a global level. And as challenging as the situation has been and may continue to be, we found that students are resilient and proactive and very open to learning through alternative means. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. So do we have to ask employers to rethink what they're looking for from graduates 
or do we have to ask employers to be more explicit in what they're looking for from their graduates? Because if you're looking at people who are resilient, proactive and open to learning, then you can't really be looking at a much better set of employees than that. So is it a myth that um, employers are looking for hands-on practice above all else? Or is this something that we must address, we cannot get away from? What do people think? And Fiona, I will ask you if nobody else puts their hand up. <laughs> Well, what do you think? <laughs> it depends. Um, <laughs> there are many different types of conservation positions, um, and uh, and and some of them. I mean, I think I think all of them obviously would benefit from having uh, students who have had more um, uh, hands-on experience um, with uh, just seeing different types of materials and uh, different states of deterioration, but. Um, uh, but there, uh, there are there are preventive conservation positions. There are planning positions. There, are, um, uh, it's it's the the um, there there could be um, there could be uh, employers who would appreciate um, students who have more experience in in um, or more knowledge of preventive conservation, uh, for example, than um, they. Uh, many of the programs traditionally provide, um, but it every employer is different. Um, it depends. It depends on what they what their expectations are for for conservation students. But I I totally agree that the the way that the students are handling this and and tackling it and trying to find solutions and really engaging and and networking about it um, just speaks to. Uh, the type of people we have in this profession and um, and how fantastic they are and <laughs> what great employee, employees they would make. So those, um, those soft skills uh, should definitely be on your CVs. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would, it depends. Um, there are positions out there for people who, uh, who will have um, the skills that you can develop through online learning, but um, it, it, uh, it, not, all of, not all employers will be looking for that. Satish, is there something you can comment on? Uh, yes, um, thanks, Jane. Uh, Jane. I think uh, in our condition here in India, it is uh, practically impossible to do away with, uh, uh, you know, practice-based training because uh, here we do not have a lot of programs as as in the other country, countries, Western world, like we have programs in preventive conservation, we have programs in different aspects of theoretical learning. Here, uh, we cannot do away with the uh, you know, practical component and therefore we're waiting to open and, and cover up what we have missed uh, in terms of practical learning. So as, as of now, in the past six months, we've been focusing more on uh, in terms of uh, developing their cognitive skills, trying to make them learn decision-making, um, but then physical training, uh, practical training is something that we cannot do away with. Um, and, and I think employers here uh, in India would be looking forward to, you know, you know, trying to find out how we have taught the, the current batch of student uh, in, in, during this COVID period. Um, so I think we cannot do away with uh, practice-based learning here. Is there, an, is there a challenge combining the last two problems that with the virtual material that we'll have a, a generation of people who are trained by watching YouTube's videos and have the tremendous self-confidence perhaps of people who haven't had an academic training um, going head to head with perhaps with people with more reflective approach, is there a danger of an almost a twin track conservator um, coming out of this, this period? Um, yes, I, I, I think, yes, um, you're right. Uh, in terms of, you know, all those people who were trained in the past, uh, uh, you know, um, the current batch of students, uh, they are at this advantage um, if you're looking at how well they have been trained. So uh, although we, I mean, see, suddenly the, the pandemic struck suddenly and we did not have enough preparation to uh, create this into a proper online teaching. And what happened that we took our classroom teaching to a virtual uh, teaching. So it's not really a kind of an online teaching system, but uh, we've just adopted it to be 
uh, to to interact with students online. So um, yes, there is there are disadvantages, um, but we hope that we will be able to uh, you know as soon as the the, the you know, restrictions are relieved, we will be able to carry out with our hands-on practical training. Um, we have already started doing staggered uh, training uh, in, in our labs with uh, only a limited number of students coming in. Uh, particularly those who are graduating this year, uh, they need to write their dissertations, they need to, to work on their practice projects. And therefore we, we have tried to create a staggered system in which uh, they would be coming and uh, doing all, all these practical work. So obviously the staggered um, aspect, Amber, I think you mentioned that in Amsterdam, somewhere, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, somewhere, Standard European. Um, this is seems to be like a common solution. Do people think that even after we're getting back in, there'll be fewer hours of, of lab work and that's just an inevitability? Or do we think that, can we, can we do that? Can we, are we going to sell the profession short if we offer much less practical time in the training courses? I think we need to take a blended approach now. Um, there has to be practice uh, hours, uh, you know, in which students will come and, and do the practice, but it can't be the way we uh, used to do in pre-COVID uh, period that, uh, you know, we had more of, you know, classroom teaching uh, kind of uh, divided between the, the lab work and the, the classroom teaching. So, Maybe now, if we take a blended approach, most of the classroom teaching can go online and, and then they have to spend less time. So maybe during eight hours of daytime, we can divide into two groups and, and you know one group works in the morning, one works in the afternoon um, in terms of creating a staggered training approach. Uh, but the contact learning has to be there. Thank you. And I think Fiona was going to come in there too. I was just going to say that we're very fortunate at Queen's uh, to be able to teach in person um, uh, right now. And uh, it's partly because we have such so few students uh, in in each class in each lab. Um, so there there are um, uh, things that have been put in place in terms of uh, acrylic dividers between, um, you know, bench areas and stuff like that. But um, uh, there has been no diminution of the of the the number of, of lab hours um, compared to usual. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I, I think it, it, I think it's, it could be a model for, for other, um, for other programs on how to, how to um, meet public health requirements and university health requirements uh, while still going forward. Thank you, Fiona. So we've got the thoughts of staggered and possibly having smaller numbers. But of course, the interesting thing with fewer numbers on a program is you perhaps undo some of the advantages you've done in terms of making it more accessible at other levels. But I'm going to move on to the next question for now, which is going to go into Sagita. Um, because again, we're now we are beginning to look at solutions um, and ask you what your favorite creative, innovative approach or solution has been to engage with students and learners through the pandemic and what makes you think what you know what do you think has been the reason why that's worked well thank you for that question which is a big question and i will try to answer through two examples through short stories but first i have to say that uh, during the summer semester of this past academic year i had the fortune of uh, teaching only theoretical uh, courses but I also have to say that I wasn't also very happy with this shift to uh, online teaching because I have worked really hard over the years to make my classroom a very dynamic space. So I do frontal teaching, of course, but I also do a lot of problem-based um, uh, assignments uh, that requires group work. We have discussions, we have conversations and some fun exercises that I have picked up at an ECROM course. Uh, so as far as lectures uh, are concerned, it, this shift to the virtual environment that was uh, that went fairly uh, smooth. But I have to say that I wasn't able to find an adequate um, uh, solution or substitute for um, problem-based assignments that my students usually work uh, in a small group. Uh, I'm simply not that edu well educated in uh, distance teaching. So uh, what happened in the end was that um, I, I would assign, uh, I would give these problem-based assignments to a student and then a student would uh, work on it and in the end present uh, the solution um, or results uh, in a written uh, format. And uh, one of the most engaging uh, assignments was actually um, something I designed 
designed for a preventive conservation course. And it was related to a situation that we had amidst the lockdown in March. There was, you have probably heard of it, there was a, an earthquake in Zagreb, Croatia's capital, uh, a, a big earthquake uh, which resulted in enormous uh, damage uh, in the historic core and affected several uh, museums. And so, as I said, this was amidst a lockdown. And uh, immediately after the earthquake, I was involved in some activities that aimed at helping these affected institutions and colleagues uh, in Zagreb. And for me personally, that was really important because it helped me uh, to cope with this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And then I thought, OK, uh, this experience, when I feel useful, that I'm doing something useful, it's something that my students could and should benefit from. So I came up with this assi assignment um, where I collected photos of damaged objects from the museums. And then I assigned one object uh, to each student. And then students were required to write, uh, write down step-by-step -step, uh, protocol or guidelines for the packing and transport of a damaged object. And then also to consider how this object should be uh, displayed in the museum uh, in the future. So this was a hypothetical scenario, but it was actually something very realistic and something that was related to the current situation. And it's something that a, a future professional could be expected to deal with uh, in his or her career. And then at the end of the semester, I asked students to produce a poster about this assignment, about their proposals. And I told them that the best uh, posters would be submitted to two conferences, uh, upcoming conferences. And so that was something that students found motivating. But I think that what motivated them um, uh, the most was the fact that the task that they had was related to some to current event. Um, and it was something that was close to them, that they uh, understood very well, and uh, it made them feel that by working on this assignment, they were actually, you know, uh, contributing to a solution to uh, to a bigger problem. Um, and I would also like so th th this is, so this was an ass an assignment that I found uh, worked very well, uh, but related to a theoretical course. And I will also want to share a very short story, uh, which was shared with me by my colleague Anna Bozicevic, who teaches at the Academy of Fine Arts in Zagreb. Uh, an exercise uh, that she developed for her very practical hands-on course um, uh, related to uh, polychrome uh, wood conservation restoration. So what she basically did, I will keep it short, uh, she produced uh, mock-ups of a polychrome surface with some overpaints and some dirt, and then she dispatched these mock-ups to her students outside of Zagreb, along with materials and tools that they would need to document the condition, perform sampling and do cleaning. But the wonderful part was, uh, and what students didn't know, that underneath those layers of uh, artificially applied dirt and over paints, what was hidden underneath were their portraits, along with their names, uh, which were uh, executed in water gilding. So each mock-up was personalized. And I think that this effort that she, had, uh, that she had invested did not go unnoticed. And it was something that students, I can only imagine how surprised and thrilled they must have been when, you know, upon completing the assignment, there was their portrait on the little mock-up. And I think that students do recognize these kinds of effort, and then they respond very well to it. And then that makes them want to you know, work harder and, and, and put more energy and time into something. And with this, I shall finish. Well, that's fantastic. Can you ask her to do us all one, please, so we can all do some home conservation? I wonder if, if other people have felt almost liberated by um, the COVID situation to actually change up and, you know, the, the throwing, the fact that we can't do things in the old way actually releases us to do things perhaps the way that we might have wanted to do it. Is that something that comes out of um, this is a period of innovation because the rules have been broken by COVID? I wish we could say we've done such exciting things, Amber. Um, David, David. Yeah, I think it's 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 true. We have to innovate not only in practical terms, but also in the way we think uh, we're doing stuff. Uh, Sujita was talking about something, it, it looks to me pretty important. It was about working about problems uh, with students. And uh, this is uh, for many years ago, uh, some topic you get into the universities and, and academic stuff, but in the practice on the classroom, on the virtual, on the Zoom or whatever, uh, I think it's very important to go to, towards that direction. I mean, to, to understand that this is an opportunity to do things on a different way.
Thank you, David. We have one more question to the panel, then we will be opening up to the audience questions. I know that the information about access will be posted or is being posted. So if we can leave pause on that question, but any other questions that are coming through, we will look at them. Does anybody else want to say anything about the their favorite creative solutions and approaches? Or are we a wee bit overawed by Sajita's colleague, Anna? In which case, I'll move to Satish who is, I'm going to ask about collaborations um, and looking forward into the future, Satish, if you could perhaps tell us what kind of collaborations you envisage that might happen in the future to help with the teaching and the programmes that you're involved with, both in the immediate COVID and perhaps on into the post-COVID era. Um, yes, uh, Jane. Um, until now, I don't think this situation of turning myself from a classroom teacher to a virtual teacher has given me enough time to think about collaboration. But now when I sit back and, and then think about what we could do, uh, you know, in this uh, period, and also once we, once we, once the pandemic is over, I don't know when that is going to happen, but um, this has given us an opportunity to create our classrooms into a global education system. Now we can develop collaborations that can, uh, you know, we can have teachers virtually teaching from anywhere across the globe. Now that hasn't happened until now. We used to try and um, organize talks in the past, but you know that were limited to a few lectures by some specialist educators uh, from across the world. Or when they were visiting India, we used to have them uh, invite them as guest lectures to, to talk to our students. But now, um, since the digital platforms are uh, you know coming up really uh, rapidly, this is an opportunity to create uh, a, a, you know the the truly international training programs across the globe. Every educational program can, can become a global training program. Uh, we can have, uh, you know, experts coming from different, uh, you know, countries, different uh, organizations, different museums, sharing their experiences, sharing their, uh, you know, knowledge with students. So that's one uh, uh, area of uh, partnership that we can have. And, and, and that, um, until now, we used to have partnership with, uh, universities and institutions and museums uh, across the globe, but that was limited to taking our students, trying to you know place them as an interns, trying to do a research collaborations and things like that. But we can extend this further to uh, you know in terms of uh, teaching as well. Now, but before we do that, uh, the challenge now is to invest heavily in information technology tools. Now we need to have partnership that can enable us to create online uh, program management uh, in terms of teaching conservation online. So lots of edutech models uh, available today, but then we need to figure out which one is going to su suit us best in terms of uh, teaching art conservation um, and particularly in our scenario. Now that's one thing. And once we are done with that, uh, you know, we can, we can develop um, online courses, we can try and make students, encourage students uh, to join other online courses which are being offered by uh, different uh, universities and institutions abroad. Um, so, and for that, we can create partnership collaborations uh, so that you know, the, the, the credit that they get uh, by attending those courses can be transferred to our program and we can have uh, their learning um, assimilated into our assessment system. Now, Creating digital teaching um, and learning resources is another area where we can collaborate and, and think about, uh, you know, how and what kind of digital resources we create. Because see, suddenly there are so much being created and uploaded online that it can be completely overwhelming for anybody to, to navigate through. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, a management tool is required. And, and for us teachers, this is an extra work or maybe uh, you know we need to learn and adapt to to managing information that that we get online and and directing student to the right direction. So so collaborations in that area would also be very welcoming. And last but not the least, but you know we need to continue with our physical training uh, collaborations that we used to have in the past. But you know we also need to continue with more of such kind of uh, trainings where we can um, either place students um, into different organizations, different museums within the country and also outside. Um, 
for uh, contract teaching provided that uh, we 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 done with this covid situation we the covid situation uh, is relaxed a bit um having said that now since we have this situation once uh, we don't know if it, if it can happen again so we need to be prepared we need to be prepared so our, our teaching programs need to be uh, you know ready to bear with any of such in, you know impact again in future if if, if it happens so collaborations to create programs that are meant for uh, teaching no matter what happens in the society so uh, you know like this time what happened suddenly we transformed our teaching from classroom to online teaching and uh, at least i have had hard time uh, interacting with students so um, these are the areas that we can collaborate uh, you know and i i think there can be more uh, collaborations there can be uh, other areas of collaborations but then we need to one one step at at a time so we need to think about uh, these uh, you know preliminary areas of uh, collaboration first and then we can perhaps go on to more specialized more uh, into uh, you know research or uh, intervention based maybe like like it happens in medical profession that uh, you know doctors try and 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 lead a team of doctors somewhere else uh, through video conferencing to to teach them how or tell them how to how the surgery need to be performed maybe we can have that kind of collaborations in in future as well that somebody remotely is trying to uh, look at the object and 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 uh, guide us through that how the conservation uh, needs to happen thank you the thought of um, someone guiding you through a conservation treatment remotely sounds quite scary, but then you think, well, if doctors are doing it, how <laughs> yes. can it be more scary for us? Yes, that, that should be most scary part. I mean, somebody is, uh, you know, directing from a remote uh, video conferencing location that, you know, uh, how to perform surgery. And if that is happening successfully, I think unless we um, experiment, we wouldn't know whether it is successful or not. So would anybody else like to share? some of their collaborations that they're working on or considering at the moment. Uh, sorry, for a second. I didn't hear. Would anybody else like to, to share on collaborations that they are engaging with, starting up, trying to get going? Go on then. Go on, Fiona, I can feel that's a yes. <laughs> You going to share something? <laughs> no. I mean, uh, no. I was just thinking about uh, about the the opportunities through access um, for uh, for these types of collaborations, and uh, and uh, I still haven't gotten around to um, submitting a list of the the topics uh, on which I could present uh, anywhere in the world remotely. <laughs> so I was just making a note to myself that I need to do that. So this is going to be where we really get to demonstrate what kind of a community we are, isn't it, in the next six to, to nine months. I'm sure we all have a, an equivalent phrase of it takes a village to raise a child and it's going to be it takes a profession to sustain the profession that we all have to, to give and take um, and contribute. And I think that's going to be one of the interesting challenges because for the students, for the next generation of conservators to come through, we absolutely have to see the current generation you know, put their hand down and and extend the you know hand to, to support them to pull through whether it's more preventive whether it's more planning whether it's more virtual or whether it is going out on site whatever role we are in in the more established positions we are going to have to help the next generation of students to come through if we are going to sustain the profession as an unbroken chain albeit changing and growing does anyone else want to comment now Eleanor and Amber, was there anything particular left from the student feedback that you felt? If I may, um, I would like to say that probably students are uh, very open to oh, these uh, remote learning. Uh, we saw, for example, students creating learning opportunities for themselves. Uh, 
for example, we had uh, a person, uh, I think it was from Cardiff, I'm, I do remember that uh, correctly, but yeah, she uh, was uh, trying to pick up some uh, traditional uh, upholstery skills from uh, her grandmother, for example. So I'm pretty sure that this person uh, that was so proactive, so open-minded to identify opportunities for themselves, she would be pretty much happy of having uh, new opportunities, uh, even, uh, uh, you know, restoring an artifact um, remotely uh, guided from, uh, uh, you know, receiving some guidance from an expert, absolutely. So I definitely think that students might be very much open uh, about these. Thank you. Yes, I'm, it was definitely a Cardiff student um, getting their grandmother. And it's, it's lovely, isn't it, to see that intergenerational work, perhaps reaching out to people who have got something to offer and who could definitely teach you those kind of skills online and would welcome the opportunity to share the time as well as their knowledge and expertise with you. Absolutely, creating mentorship opportunities uh, as well. Uh, that was uh, one of the uh, things that uh, we encountered, people looking for guidance. So I think that even uh, uh, remote mentorship programs might work as well in this case. Definitely, and that's something we looked at in Cardiff and have done some surveys on the students. But I think at this point we will allow the rest of the audience to join in um, ma uh, managed via Shabnam who's going to take over for the open question section but just thank you so much for everything you said and for the the depth and the shade of this it's um it's a complex time and um I don't think we're going to have all the answers by the end of the day but it is quite nice to have quite an honest and frank exchange as well as real highlights of inspiration there thank you Shabnam Thank you, Jen. And hello, everyone from Canada, um, the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples. And I would like to take this opportunity and honor the ancestry, heritage, and gifts of Indigenous peoples and give thanks to them. Um, thank you to the panelists for this really uh, informative and engaging, um, you know, discussion and for sharing your diverse perspectives with us. And, you know, it's incredible to see how we have been impacted by the, the pandemic situation. But I think that all of us have one goal in common, and that's to help our students, you know, and provide them with the best uh, learning experience and, you know, with the highest quality possible, and also ensuring that there are equitable opportunities available for them to learn no matter the challenges that we face today. And I also wanted to thank you again, Amber and Eleonora for the great job that you have done in terms of spearheading this social media campaign and bringing the students voices and perspectives to this table and you know, for our information because we as educators, trainers, we think that we are doing the best job ever but we really don't know the challenges or difficulties that our students are facing. So it's perfect to see how you know this is working on both sides of the tables. So uh, we have received many interesting questions and some of them might be you know things that we have been discussing but I'll try my best to put them to the speakers as, as we go around and uh, we'll see how we go. And there are also a, a number of comments that might be useful for everyone to listen to. So once in a while I try to bring in a comment from one of the participants at the um, at this you know uh, webinar um, just bear with me please so I can scroll down my screen here so um, so I won't mention the names just to save time uh, the first question is from a uh, participant from Pakistan that has attended workshops on painting restriction uh, restoration and the question is, how ICROM can support and provide opportunities for the emerging art restorers who are passionate to learn and get formal trainings, especially in this pandemic situation. So I guess it's to you, Zika, uh, to answer this question, please. Yes, so thank you for the question. So as, as we mentioned before, ICROM works for the service of its member states and in line with the non uh, philosophy of the sustainable development goals of leaving no one behind. And that has to do with bridging inequalities and also through uh, partnerships. So I think there is no straightforward answer to that as we are all learning and adapting uh, not as a result of the, the pandemic, which was a catalyst. As you saw, there were already something going on online and now we had to take the leap 
and, and be creative. So uh, you can, uh, of course, we will continue to uh, seek means you not know, to provide the, the best enabling environment and building capacity for colleagues uh, in all the member states taking advantage you know, of, of the, uh, this partnership and ex expertise available across the, the networks. Uh, through, uh, we started to move on uh, a little bit on blended and slowly also into online capacity building activities, which is also a, a transition for us. And I think as uh, Satish was saying, it, it will be at some point a blended approach, which will have to be tailored for the particular situation as was discussed before. Uh, there's a lot of inequalities, so it's very heterogeneous also, you know, the, the resource and uh, profession as a whole. So we'll have to, to tailor to the partic particular situation, take advantage of the, the best available resources, and also always aiming you know, to, to provide the, the best capacity building. I think for now, the, the main uh, goal would be to, to try to reach a balance, if possible, through blended approach. But then, depending on the situation, we'll have to go fully online for a while. So we'll, we'll have to adapt. And um, yeah, so I, I have no straightforward answer, but we'll continue to, to collaborate and learn together and, and bring the best you know, from, from what we learned to, to the member states. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, given the importance of hands-on work, would graduation be delayed in order to ensure the students have sufficient practical experience? since job availability is highly limited as well right now anyway. So anyone wants to respond to this question? No volunteers? Um, Sagita and then Satish, please. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I, I can only speak from the perspective of my university and the situation in Croatia. We had the fortune that uh, at the beginning of May, our universities uh, did reopen and our schools uh, partially, but universities did reopen. And so um, at that point, uh, uh, the teaching from the uh, related to theoretical courses continued online, but we enabled all students, uh, especially those who are working, the graduates who are working on their final projects to return to the classrooms. And one of the reasons why those who uh, teach uh, theoretical courses were encouraged to continue with online teaching was that we also, in a way, uh, transformed the classical classroom into a conservation restoration studio. So uh, in a way, and also um, uh, the study period was um, prolonged until the end of July. So students uh, really had the op opportunity to um, catch up on their practical work. And we are also uh, in a way fortunate, uh, hopefully fortunate that next week when the new academic year uh, starts, we, uh, we will return to the classrooms. We will continue either in a, in a blended mode, or, but in the traditional mode as well. So there was no need at our uni my university at least to, uh, to make such a, uh, to postpone uh, the graduation. Thank you. Satish? Yeah, I mean, I think in our situation as well, it is going to be delayed, um, not by a six month, but at, at least by a few months. Um, because I think conservation training is not something like learning how to cook, uh, you know, a special dish on, and looking at online videos and trying to cook. If you mess up with your dish, uh, you can recook you can redo things again, but that's not going to happen with artworks. So we can't really rely on um, teaching practical stuff, hands-on stuff online. And therefore, we, we have to teach them uh, in contact uh, with us that uh, they are exposed to hands-on learning. Perfect, thank you. So Amber or Eleonora, did you hear anything from uh, students when you were interacting with them online? about any concerns about graduations or no particular mention. Okay. Okay, perfect. So there is a question for Fiona. Uh, Fiona was mentioning the difficulty uh, of establishing networks when we only have online teaching available. Um, and the participant is wondering whether we as teachers should think differently about how we promote or establish networks. As I know that the students are very successful at creating online networks. What can we learn from students in this respect? 
Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I think uh, my my main uh, problem difficulty in establishing networks has been only with um, courses where this class does not go through as a cohort, where it's people on individual contracts that that um, so there's no. I I I have found that um, it. Uh, it is possible and effective to facilitate um, the creation of networks and communities um, uh, as an instructor and with the assistance of the students if, if the class is going through as a cohort. Um, the weekly uh, simultaneous um, chats, um, this was pre, um, predates Zoom and, <laughs> and other, um, other uh, platforms, but uh, they, they worked very well um, in, in creating networks and uh, people got to know each other very well. I think nowadays, certainly um, I, I, would, um, I would ask uh, students for their input on how to, uh, how to create those networks. Um, and uh, they will have many more um, good ideas than, than I could come up with myself. So I, yeah, I would recommend involving the students in, in uh, setting those up. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to respond to this question? Good, okay. So um, I think the next uh, question uh, is, is it possible to set a student's practicals online that they do at home? Then they present and critique the presentation of their practicals online so as to get some practical direction. Uh, so uh, I think referring to maybe immovable type of conservation. So Terry, do you have any insights to share with us with regard to this question? I, I think the challenge for me in addressing the question is, is that, you know, from the beginning, from March, there is not any classroom experience, not in online teaching or anything. So um, I think maybe what, what I'm hearing in the and the questions also just highlights this issue of the, call it the digital divide or inequality, if you want. And, and the question it raises for me is what can we do as a heritage conservation community to address this particular issue? Okay, great. Yes, Fiona. Um, just a quick example of a, uh, of um an exercise that um that i used to do when i taught a metals course online which was just um we had a we had a students uh find a variety of, of metals and uh do several experiments on them um to you know for establish very various, various characteristics and one one thing was was um experimenting with different types of polishing products and techniques and we would we would meet after you know on a weekly basis and discuss um the results of these these activities. Um, so there, there are lots of examples of, of those types of things that can be done. Again, I'm not saying it's, it's a, it's a full replacement for face to face, but, um, but, you know, uh, there are, there are ways of, of, uh, of, of having those practical exercises. Yes, Sagita. Yeah, well, I wanted to say that it uh, does depend on, um, uh, what students in practice work on. Uh, at my program, for example, um, students perform um, treatments uh, on real objects uh, starting from the second year uh, until the fifth year. And the thing is that um, the objects that we treat are usually pro uh, uh, listed uh, cultural heritage uh, items um, uh, whose conservation restoration is funded by the Ministry of Culture. And so you have, in order to be able to work on such an artwork, you have to be able to secure, you know, proper surrounding from, uh, you know, physical protection to fire protection, whatever. Um, so it is not, I mean, it, it is not possible for a student to, you know, simply take a sculpture, take it home <laughs> and then perform some work this work has to be done uh, within the studio and also uh, the mentor is the person that is legally responsible for the well-being of the uh, artifact so I, I would say that it uh, uh, in in such a situation on, or, or in such a setting it's it's um, it, it's not possible uh, to allow the student to take the object uh, uh, home and then and then also um, we have to take into consideration that uh, 
people live in different kinds of circumstances in uh, small rented rooms with uh, there are limitations of, of, of that sort uh, so so uh, when it comes to wor uh, working on proper uh, artworks uh, objects of artistic or historical uh, significance it's uh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't see how that would be possible to uh, to enable someone to perform such work um, from home with supervision from the mentor uh, or through some online channel uh, and then also distance mentoring. Uh, that's that's one uh, obstacle that, that I see, but it's, I'm, I'm not sure. I hope that I have understood the question correctly. Thank, that's, that's Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So David, yes. Yeah, thank you. I um, also agree there are some certain practices that can be done remotely. I, for instance, uh, when all this started, I had a preventive conservation se uh, seminar, and we have to end the, the seminar working with a museum because it was a practical uh, content of the seminar. So I have to call the museum until then, please take a video camera and open your own scene spaces in order for my students to finish their practice. So I think this is possible, not in the better terms, but I think it's really helpful to think about what can we do and what we don't, because that's true. There are certain limits and also virtuality means that some students are not present in, uh, in Bogota. I mean, they, they, they go on to their homes on, all, all over, not only here in Colombia, in, in, in other countries as well. So we have to finish the class with the practical uh, sense of it uh, on a virtual mode. So we have to deal with it. Thank you, that's great. So Satish, did you have anything to add? You, I think I saw your hand. Um, yes, it is possible to some extent, although it is not going to be um, as good as, uh, you know, the contact teaching in the labs, uh, where we have original objects. But then, um, you know, I've been experimenting with my students, you know, asking them to find unused uh, utensils and stuff in their home, try and some of the metal artifacts, put it under, under soil with, with some salt and then observe what, what goes wrong after 15, 20 days. So these kind of... Uh, Preliminary investigation observations are possible, but you know when we're talking about real uh, practice, as uh, Sadita was saying, you know on actual objects, that's certainly not possible at home conditions. Thank you. Yes, Amber. Um, I just wanted to say, um, with regards to what Fiona was saying, that you know um, being able to do things with the students that they can do at home is very helpful in the sense that you know you get a feel for materials and maybe doing that research on what the material is like and just experimenting with it would be is very helpful and we've had a student who has said that that's what she's been doing with her spare time but I also just wanted to point out that as a student I'm sure you'll remember it's very scary so even if we were allowed to have an object that we could bring home which we can't even when I was in my labs, even when my lecturer was right next to me, I was so terrified to touch that object. It's a very scary experience. So um, I think just recognizing that it's a scary moment when you're working on a real object and having you guys, you teachers there to kind of keep us feeling secure and that we're okay and that we're not going to break it. Is, is, is very helpful. And we kind of need that in person, I feel. And that's all. Thank you, Amber. Yes, Fiona. Uh, very quickly, um, I completely remember that feeling <laughs> and uh, I still get that feeling. Um, I should have specified that the exercise I was talking about um, was first of all, it was not on objects from um, uh, that were would, would have been treated in, in the lab at school. These were things that people had, could find around their home. Also, it was um, that those particular access exercises, so far I have only taught to uh, in, not in a university setting. I've taught them for uh, professional development courses that I teach for museum workers. Um, sometimes conservators take them if they, you know, if 
for example, metals is not their area of expertise and they want, they want to know more, but, um, but they're, they're designed to um, uh, specifically for, um, to teach certain, um, to, to get familiarity with, with materials and, and certain techniques that non-conservators can, can undertake. So I should have clarified that. Yeah, this is perfect, thank you. Yes, Jane. I just want to say, I think there's, there's something that you can definitely do at home in terms of techniques and observations, which is still slightly different from doing conservation, because the thing that Amber mentioned about that sort of almost that fear of the object, that is a relationship with the object that transcends because it is important to someone and it's a response to the significance of the object that is different from taking a broken thing from your house and burying it in the garden. And there's nothing wrong whatsoever practicing your surface cleaning, practicing your decay, any of those experimental techniques. But I think the conservators that we want to graduate are whole conservators who understand the objects are more than just their materials and I think that is the difficulty isn't it in terms of you know you can't take those things that Sagita was saying you can't take those things home the reason why so many of us value teaching with real muse museum objects is because conservation is greater than the sum of the techniques Exactly. So it's actually a good segue to what I was going to mention here, that we talk about technical hands-on techniques and requirements. We should also remind ourselves that being an interdisciplinary field, we really need to focus on soft skills and the skills that are required to do a project with a group. So like, for example, for practicum students or intern students who are you know, required to work in an actual place, this is a big challenge, how they are going to gain those soft skills as part of their you know, uh, profession. So those are all valid questions and concerns. So maybe we move on to the next question because I'm cognizant of the time. Um, just bear with me. So um, uh, this is a question about the, how to learn the bench techniques online, uh, and so it depends on IT and camera. Maybe we discussed this, that some things need to be touched and felt to establish and be able to restore or conserve. Hence, this is not the best possible solution and where and when possible hands-on training should not be substitute for online. So it's basically more like a comment and you know, in line with what we were talking about. So the next question is from a conservation assistant involved in heritage conservation teaching and outreach program with a local uh, school uh, near Victoria Falls World Heritage Site. Uh, so they're appreciating this webinar and uh, they are thinking, is there any assistance available of any kind to en enable local people, especially young learners, living adjacent to the World Heritage property continue accessing necessary conservation education? So it's basically about partnerships and how we are working with other stakeholders in the field. So anyone has any uh, suggestions to offer in terms of collaboration? I think um, it, this period has been very difficult for all of us and we have so much to consider internally that it's been difficult to focus on external relationship building. So maybe this is a question for us to Hunter, further on, and, oh, Terry, yes. Yeah, I think it might be worthwhile, maybe Jane can answer this. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, the uh, scholarship possibility, IIC scholarship possibilities being offered by the Getty um, to attend the conference in Edinburgh. I'd maybe share a little bit more about that, because I think that's something listeners might want to take advantage of. I think the deadline is coming up very soon. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, do, do you worry that the global lockdown will deter or discourage future generations from becoming conservationists as sites and countries are harder to access due to COVID-19? What's the future of the field? Yes, David. Yeah, I think we don't have yet an answer for that question. I think um, there will be uh, the dark side as Terry put on their terms, uh, but also I think there will be always new needs um, for professionals. Uh, people will keep caring about their heritage. It doesn't matter 
if we are on lockdown or we are not. So this will not change. I think uh, on the contrary, uh, people are getting mo more access to the heritage resources. So if this access enables and, and if the governments go better on the internet connections, on the educational resources, I think heritage will be remain important for us all. So maybe we have seen, uh, we, we will see, sorry, uh, uh, disturbance uh, on, the, on the near future, but um, on, on a greater scale, it will remain. Yes, Eka. Yes, thank you. So I think, I mean, the core of our business as heritage conservation is the value and the significance of heritage and people care. So recently we run a survey just asking people around the world if and how much they care about what was on movable heritage. And it was a massive yes to a large extent. So because we keep telling ourselves it's important. So we wanted to hear, you know, the public in general, the common person. It was a massive yes. And I think as long as people care, and they do care. So, I mean, depending on, you know, irrespective of the typology of heritage, because it's also evolving, digital heritage is growing like exponentially. So I think there's always going to be uh, interest and, and uh, uh, ways you not know, to, to uh, build capacity as long as, as it uh, is perceived as relevant. And it is, I mean, it's at the core of, uh, of our societies. It's just the, you know, the typologies and the, the modalities that might evolve. But I think our core business is to sustain society through, through conservation. And in my opinion, it's going to be there and continue to be strong. Yes, perfect. Thank you. And I think this, this webinar is an evidence that there is certainly an interest among us, especially the emerging professionals and you know, students to be part of this. So it's overwhelming to see how well received. So it's a matter of being relevant to what's happening outside of our you know, community in a way. Um, so uh, there are two questions that go hand in hand and I will ask them together and it's for the faculty on the panel. So will you permanently adopt any of the online tools that you have had to start using during the pandemic to your courses curricula? Uh, one, it is safe to have on-site instruction again. And also the other question is, what if the COVID-19 crisis is over? Would you still do the teaching online apart from all which requires senses, practical skills, or is online teaching the second best in your opinion? It's a very difficult question. Yes, Sagita. Yeah, well, I will give a simple, provide a simple answer to the difficult question. Um, I actually intend to keep on uh, to, to keep some of these uh, modalities in my regular teaching. One thing I like really much is uh, doing these pre-recorded lectures and then students can access and view at their own pace, which will enable me to use the classroom time, which I now really appreciate, to do more uh, you know, um, discussions and group exercises. Uh, so so, so that, that's, I think that will be for me, I think the major benefit, uh, using the classroom time slightly more differently. Yes, perfect, thank you. Satish? Yeah, I you know, I think uh, I agree with Sarita and, uh, you know, since we have invented this new method of teaching uh, and that is what I talked about synchronous and asynchronous blending, synchronous and asynchronous ways of teaching. Um, so if we, if we keep a blended approach, then uh, as Sarita mentioned that we can utilize the time, uh, the contact hours for better uh, training of students in terms of discussion, in terms of practical hands-on work. Um, and the other part of theoretical teaching can go online uh, with, uh, you know, with the support of any of these online um, tools. Perfect, thank you. Any further thoughts? Okay, I think- Can I just say that I definitely don't think that online is better or worse. I think it's a very much a Fiona Graham, it depends answer. I think that if you are teaching, um, bench conservation, then you have to be at the bench. I think that's an absolute definite. But I think there's many advantages of remote learning in terms of diversity, access, equality of opportunity. There are some 
um, really big improvements in terms of, of that. And I think Sagita is talking about the flipped learning. I think a lot of us in academia have been encouraged to flip our learning and been kind of edging towards it. And now we've been kicked right up the pants towards it. But, um, and I know again, Fiona has been ahead of us um, delivering, delivering online learning now. I think the, the opportunity to think differently has been fantastic and hopefully the, the sharing of expertise will come through, but I can't see us ever, you know, leaving the labs in as far as teaching practical conservatives and that remains a huge challenge for us. Thank you. So um, I'm just looking at the clock here and I apologize to those who have, you know, asked questions and there are wonderful questions. We'll discuss internally and find a way to ask, you know, those questions and find, you know, answers. So we'll see how it goes. But I will ask one last question. Um, and um, I think it's like very relevant that um, someone is asking about the employment prospects for this, you know, pandemic classes. Would students graduating these days would have less opportunities comparing to those who have had really hands-on? So that's a big question. And I don't know if anyone has a quick response to this question, but uh, something to, to think about. And I think that's really important because we know that the graduates of 2020 or 2021 had this pandemic behind, you know, and it's in their transcripts in a way. So I think that's a really, that's a really big question for us to consider. So um, before I hand it over to uh, Jose Luis, I was going to ask our panelists to go around the room. I will call based on the who I see first on, on my screen and ask what is your takeaway message in one sentence? So I will start with Satish, please. Uh, hi, um, I would say, uh, you know, since we have had this unprecedented scenario, uh, I would say that, you know, brace for impact and be prepared for another or, uh, you know, more uh, or similar kinds of situations that may happen. I, although I wish that nothing of this sort should come our way, but then if it does, we, we need to be prepared. Perfect. Thank you. David? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's time to think about what we have done and how we have done it. I mean, to keep finding new ways for linking academies and museums, uh, for viable learning and conservation, and for better preservation of our collections with or without lockdowns. Thank you. Sakita. Well, very briefly, I would just say, I appreciate the time that you spend in the classroom or studio with your students and get to know them and their interests and strengths and weaknesses. Thank you. Thank you. Eleonora. Uh, thank you. Um, of course, mine is a perspective uh, uh, coming from uh, my student experience. I think that, uh, you know, my takeaway message would be that heritage conservation students are resilient. They are open to creative alternatives, in some cases are even uh, uh, self-starters, uh, you know, as they identify opportunities for themselves. Um, and I think that they would be very receptive of uh, all of the experiences we discussed here and open to different alternatives that uh, their teachers and instructor will uh, propose to them. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Amber? Um, I would mainly just like to say that, you know, we've learned from the students that learning opportunities can be found anywhere, they can take place anywhere from practical skills, as already mentioned, like upholstering with your grandmother at home, to people focusing on their digital skills or documentation and their learning and their trying through all of this. And I think we all are and also, I just want to say thank you to all of you teachers who have put so much time in and creating new ways to try and teach us and make it easier for us. Um, and I'm pretty sure I can say thank you to you from all students, maybe. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Fiona? Um. Well, I would say, I'd like to say two things, but I'll stick to one. Um, when it makes sense, uh, we should use this opportunity to introduce remote learning options so that a broader range of students can enter the conservation field. 
Perfect, thank you. And Terry, please. Yeah, <clears throat> I think I'd like to go back to a point that David made in his presentation about you know, these moments of crises and challenges that we face, but they're often uh, you know, generators of innovation and creativity. So I, I hope we can can use this situation in that spirit, and and I look forward to other opportunities to share what those innovations and creative outputs might be. Thank you again, everyone. So I turn it over to Zeka, please. Thank you, Shabnam. So just before we conclude, as my final remark. I'd like to stress that uh, heritage conservation is at the heart of preserving values and ensuring continuity and sustainability for our societies. So today's students will be tomorrow's professionals playing this critical role. So it's, it's fundamental to make sure that uh, heritage conservation learning remains strong and responsive to change in our uncertain and fast changing world, irrespective of the shape and form it takes. And in view of that, I so just stress once again that ICROM will continue to support uh, its member states in providing uh, meaningful capacity building conservation, which also includes, by the way, communication and teaching skills in conservation and science. So please check uh, the ICROM website for the forthcoming uh, capacity building activities. I, I recall there was a question on uh, professional development training. And this is one core business of uh, ICRO. So I'd like now then to conclude by firstly thanking our wonderful speakers today who have so kindly uh, given the time to be with us. Big round of applause. Our colleagues from Athabasca University and IIC, which are the co-organizers of this webinar, and also to our organizing team at ICRO, who have been uh, working hard behind the scenes to make this uh, series of uh, webinars to you. And I would also, uh, also like to ask you who have joined us today for your interest and questions and uh, lively participation. The recording of this webinar will soon be available on the ECROM website and also on the YouTube channel. Please stay tuned for future webinars of the ECROM lecture series. And now I would like to, before I uh, say goodbye to you, uh, ask for the slide with the, the series of the, the next forthcoming webinars. So the slide will be posted soon. You can get additional information on the WICROM website and social media platform. Thank you very much for being with us. I hope you join us again soon. Best regards and stay well. Goodbye from us. <laughs>